Good morning. How's it going? It's going awesome. I like your shirt. And how it? Yeah, yeah. I got my John Saunders uh, Saunders Machine Works shirt on. I love this thing. Sweet. How uh, How was your week? My week was uh, very very awesome. I had one of those midweek. I had one of those down days where you're just not like super excited about things, but then uh-huh. the other four three days were just amazing, um, super productive, and just kind of those days where you feel like you're really on it and things are accomplishing you know awesome what was the was the down day machine stuff or business stuff or what no i i woke up with this headache and i just couldn't get in the groove that entire day you know usually i can pull myself out of it i was just kind of in a down day i don't know why yeah no it's funny i i still got a lot done do you it's funny i uh sometimes when i have those i'll just kind of switch into go mode where i just bang through somewhat like mindless stuff because I'm, I'm lacking that inspiration i'm lacking that hustle and drive and i'm like well i might as well i still have this like insatiable need to ac- com- accomplish stuff and this is actually funny because i wanted to ask you about goals and for me i think one of my goals is to actually start kind of like tone it down a little i i, I think i push myself too hard on a regular basis because i for some reason just have this desire to keep not growing because I don't necessarily aspire to grow, but to keep doing great things. And I think that um, having more balanced downtime and my comment was like slow is fast. I talk about this in that chip break. Mm -hmm. Um, So still being productive, but also recognizing, Hey, it's okay. You know, like go watch a movie, go hang out with the kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you know, I hate to use the word work-life balance, but there is absolutely, um, you have to manage everything that's important to you. Otherwise you're just going to go crazy or lose something, lose something that's important to you. Um, I heard this really great quote that said, uh, if you don't have time for something like for me right now, my YouTube focus, my, my video editing is sort of taking a big back burner. And I keep saying, I don't have time to do that. You have to change that phrase instead of, I don't have time to do that. Um, it's not a priority for me right now. Be- yeah, and you have to be completely okay with the fact that it's not a priority because you're choosing to make it not a priority. Like, I'm choosing to do other stuff instead of edit videos and get them up on YouTube. Um, but the second half yeah, of that okay sentence that. is just as important because I have a really hard time saying no to stuff, to job shop work that I probably shouldn't take on because I've got other irons in the fire. But the second mm-hmm. half, at the moment, like right now, I can't do it. It's not a forever decision. Maybe next month, maybe next week. Like, um, right. And so that then was it my might be a priority. Right. Um, I think you mentioned this to me. I can't remember. It was either that you mentioned it to me, or it was like a culmination of that, and then that like idea of um, writing your own obituary that we talked about in a book you read. Uh, uh, it was a vlog blog okay but um yeah. it's 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 totally how i've i've been thinking about my goals recently and 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 you know big year goals like stuff like that which i'm not always a huge fan of but mm-hmm. even at the day because as an entrepreneur and in my to-do lists and there's john the machinist there's john the shop guy there's john the entrepreneur um it's unbelievable how much i could feel like i have to get done but what i have to do now is tell myself hey today's friday um, I would really smile and be happy and proud of myself if at the end of the day um, I've done three things. You know, I've, I've dialed in this reamer on the machine. I've gotten this fixture offset repeatedly working. Um, I need to edit one video. And kind of it, to, to, for me, the, the big difference is it lets me um, put a cap on how much I think is reasonable and, and really fulfilling to get done versus if I say, today I want to get this done, I can have a list of 27 <clears throat> things and I, I don't get totally. them done. Yeah, I totally understand. That's it, it's it's actually very common, um, you know, among high achievers and and people that just strive to do so much. I could easily write down thirty things on my to do list today that I would want to do. Yeah. But at the end, you just you just have to put on three to five things, and with those three to five things, if you can actually accomplish them, and they're like super important, you know, progress making right. things, you have to be totally okay with the fact that you did that and not the other things. Um, there's this great other podcast. Uh, it's called the MFCEO podcast. Have you ever heard that? No. Oh, uh, somebody referred me to him. Uh, he, he I, I quickly learned what MF stands for. Yes. 
it's a really really good business podcast i listen to it a lot uh-huh. and uh he's got this one called called win the day and he's for the past 16 years he's made a power list every day of five things that have to get done today and they're like super priority things and they all stack on top of each other and you get this domino effect um so yeah i did the same thing That's yesterday. Great. yeah i did the same thing yesterday i went into the shop i said uh I want to cut up these Timascus handles. I want to get back to these emails. Um, I forget there was one other thing. And then I, I want to leave early so that I can go take my daughter ice skating. Yes, right. Um, I actually want to come back to the Timascus because I saw that picture on Instagram. But um, I've made that decision too. Like you make your own happiness. I can get in my truck at the end of the day and drive home to see my wife, which is kind of like the highlight of the day. It's like how was... Um, yeah. It's funny because I actually get home, I see her, I had we have dinner, and then I go back to work. I usually go back to work or, or work <laughs> from home. Nice. But um, but like you choose what mood you want to be in, and like yeah, sure, every once in a while you'll have a day that legitimately stunk, like you you really goof, you screwed something up, or it, you know we, it's okay to have bad days. But um, you know eighty yeah. percent. I mean, I love what I do, and it's not okay to go home stressed and unsatisfied and unfulfilled because I didn't get enough done. Like we're human. Um, recognize that totally. Totally. And we, we do love what we do and we get to do amazing things like every day and you feel guilty coming home, um, feeling sad and depressed and and stressed Right. when you think back and you're like, look at all that we've accomplished and look at all that we get to do every day. Like things are amazing. Yeah. We have this, uh, we're having a uh, training class this week at the shop and we had a guy who took a business. Uh, he lost a bunch of money, like, like multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars in a franchise 10, 15 years ago. And I was like, Oh my God, like that's, I'm so sorry. That's devastating. He's like, no, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned, um, relatively cheaply, um, which I was thinking that's not cheap to me, but okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I I learned a lesson. And so he's like, I took $8,000 and turned it into a multi-million dollar consulting company in the, I think it's the healthcare industry. And he's got 19 employees and they're internationally known for doing some specific thing in the healthcare industry. And uh, he's like, I named my brother the CEO because I knew I didn't want to do certain things, which to me, I'm like, this guy, I love this guy. I want to hug this guy because he, yeah. like, to, to me, about being an entrepreneur is like being okay with uh, putting the ego aside, knowing what you're good at and not good at. But what still struck me was he just flew up from, from Georgia for uh, a two-day advanced camp class, and he was sort of talking about how it was really hard to get away. And I'm like... That's tough because if you really want to do something like that and you are the number two at a multi-million dollar company that you own um, and you can't get away for two days to go take a fun class, then what, yeah. is, what is success? Right. You don't want to be buried by success. Right. You know? Hmm. Um, hey, speaking of success, what? tell me about this photo on Instagram with all of these Timascus. So... Damascus is this very awesome, expensive titanium Damascus, basically. Um, and it comes in these these flat bars, like uh, 5 sixteenths thick by 2 inch by 11 inches usually. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes I'll send them out to get water jet cut to make the handles, and okay. sometimes I'll cut them up myself. That's why I made those big carve smart jaws. Yeah, they're like 18 inch wide. They span two vices. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Got it. And and they're working phenomenally well to hold. Like, they were worth the effort to make. Um, so, yeah, it holds the parts, and then I'm able to cut out um, handles and clips from it. Leaving I'm leaving about eight thou on the floor. So you pull your, um, on your orange vices, you pull off your fixture body things and just throw the jaws, or the movables back on, and that's that easy? Yep. Yeah, yep. that's awesome. And it's super repeatable. I don't, I use the same offset every time and oh so you don't even have to probe it in no that's so cool oh my god that's awesome because the car the carve smarts have those pins in them so they're totally repeatable right and you do it off the center fixed jaw then yeah basically that's amazing i was thinking about that um actually as i (laughs) i wasn't joking 10 minutes ago when i said dialing in some fixture repeatable stuff it's like you know, G fifty four, G fifty five. It's like not nothing new, even to me. But this idea of having like permanent lifetime locations of those, mm-hmm. um, and actually, we're doing a February one of these February webinars for the Fusion team. They're like Friday at one p.m. East Coast time, and they're just free webinars. And they wanted to, they wanted us to do one on um, something like getting started with a Haas, like kind of like what's how do you do that? And I thought. I don't know. It's kind of a weird topic. And then I realized, wait a minute. No, let's show 
So we modeled up our table and all of our orange vices, and they're all mounted in a specific location. And so it's definitely not machine simulation, but it's going to become like my new sort of template file for how I start. I probably wouldn't pull it up for a little job shop job, but um, for something where I'm going to roll out a new product or something like that, because in that file, you can have uh, your tool library, your templates um, for operations, and you've got all of your vice layouts, which is really going to help me think about, um, you know, I'm not a good visual. I'm not a good, I love thinking in my head, but it really helps me to have something in front of me on the screen. Yeah. Once you design it, then you can actually wrap your head around it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, are you still going to stick with kind of one offset? And, and base it off of your model or so no, no sorry no i still like the idea of having at least so there's four vices um at least two maybe four because you know if you pull one or two vices off you want to someone was arguing with me about that the other day of if you know where everything is relative to each other you should only need one offset and i'm like yeah, yeah but no. ex- exactly right and i'm like it doesn't take much time at all to add that in and it gives you a it gives you uh, what I'm never going to do is come back into Fusion and say, oh, this vice is actually 7,000, you know, further in X yeah. and move it over. No way. No. What you could do is you could have each vice has its own offset, G54, 5, 6, 7. Yeah. Um, and then do it off the center jaw, I guess. I have 22 offsets that I currently use. Seriously? Yeah, each one's got, like, <laughs> each set of soft jaws is its own offset. And they're all labeled. I can label them in my machine. So one's like Mori Fixture, uh, Rask Top, yep. or whatever it's called. Um, and, so with the, with the Haas, I love it, but everything is just so much more high strung. Like I'm realizing I've got to feed it reverse osmosis water, and you've got to do more clean. And, and it's um, what I was thinking of here is I was trying to dial in, you know, tents on, on my work holding and fixturing, and I'm learning that using a torque wrench for everything is incredibly important torquing bolts down to the correct torque for hold down stuff and then um, so sort of maximizing hold down but then also just repeatability even for your lower uh pressure stuff just like how you close a vice on something and i was talking to my sandvik guy and he was talking about even how insert pockets torque is so much more important than people uh appreciate Hmm. Yeah, I can't say I really torque anything, but except for the the uh, arm torque, you know, of tightening a vice the right, same way every right. time. Um, but I get it. I was getting the jaw lift on the center fixed jaw on those orange vices. Not much, but enough that I was very alarmed and concerned. And sure enough, tightening those half 13s down to 65 foot pounds, uh, which is way more than you'll get with a little standard Allen key. Right. Fixed it. That kept them flat. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, um, about the repeatability thing, and like, yeah, some people say you can just model up all your vices, and you only need one G54, but when we're measuring in tenths here, right. like, now that we can measure every tenth, um, you kind of want it to be perfect, because you have the ability to make it perfect, and I don't want to make bad parts, so everything gets <laughs> its own offset, and everything gets probed often, and my probe gets indicated at least once a month. Really? Um, so that it sp- spins on true. Oh, I, um, I should do that again then. Earn it. I actually heard, I think I heard Tim Paul say that comment somewhere on Instagram that uh, it was routine to measure it every week or something like that. I used to uh, keep my tense indicator in the toolbox and I would take it out when needed and now it just lives neck. It lives like on the Hodge yep. because I'm grabbing it like every three hours now. Yeah, mine is attached to my Noga base and attached uh, to the top of the chip conveyor. Yes. On the Mori and I, I pull it out all the time. It was weird when we went to Kentucky last week to pick up that uh, Okamoto surface grinder. I walked into their shop and they had twin Dura Vertical 5100s next to each other. And I was no like, way. it's Grimm's most machine. That's awesome. But yeah, it was cool. It's the kind of machine you never really hear about. It's not super popular, but then the deeper you go, the more you see. Like, I'm starting to see more and more pop up on Instagram, and these bigger shops just kind of have them right. and don't say anything, right? But it's like uh, Liberty Machine up in Maine. I, uh, is Seth, yeah. Seth, right? I don't, I don't know his name, but I know who yeah. you're talking about. Um, he, you know, the people that own Dura Verticals, 5100s, like, love them. It's like this secret, and yeah. they're great machines, so anyways. Yeah, he, he's got one in his garage at home. He said he had to cut the side of the wall out <laughs> to get the thing in. No, um, no. He poured the pad, delivered the machine, and then built the thing around it, I think. Okay. <laughs> like crazy. Awesome. 
Um, I should go in like ten minutes. But um, what's uh, what's on tap for today? Today, now that I have those Tamascus pieces cut out into blanks, yep. Um, I have to I have to disc sand them so that they're totally flat on one side because they warped a little bit. Like oh. the material, the way they make it is crazy with heat and pressure and hammers and all kinds of stuff. So it's got all kinds of stress built up inside. Right. So I'm just going to disc sand the top side so that they're flat on one side. And then I can put them in my big Rask fixture and make handles out of them. Got it. Um, I got a bunch of customers super duper duper excited to see these things uh, finished up into knives. And uh, yeah, hopefully I can machine those today. And then Eric can get to uh, finishing them as a knife. Tweet. So that, that's my big goal for today, and then a bunch of shop stuff um, otherwise. So it just, it's, it's banging away on the Rask reorders? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Are you doing that? You were talking about doing that thing where you like stacked up the week's orders that, of, that are shipping out and then sent them on Friday? Right. Sweet. Yeah, and we've been doing that this week, uh, making okay progress. I, I want to see us make a lot more progress every week. Right. But it's, it's one of those domino games that as long as you put in a system now, so that you have a trackable metric, not just like, oh yeah, we shipped a bunch of knives last week, but you don't know how many. Yeah. Um, we're starting to actually track that kind of metric stuff so that we can improve and we can know what we're doing well and what we're to suck at. Right. Um, and then get better. That's what Because, I... yeah, I was just going to say, we have a lot of uh, obligation to fulfill with these Rask knives, and uh, we're doing a good job, but we need to speed it up. Right. But be realistic. I mean, don't speed it up because you think you want it sped up they speed it up because you think you've yeah. got the equipment process you know what i mean like it's it is what it is yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and we obviously can't suffer an ounce of quality um the, the, so. the, the, i told somebody yesterday that was watching me work on the haas i'm like i'm going full grimsmo on these uh on this <laughs> on this part <laughs> nice um no but like that's that's like my thing for 17 is trying to balance and figure out that love and passion for being both a machinist and being an entrepreneur. And they're like completely separate roles. They're completely separate people, mindsets, characters, levels of attention to detail, like focused and short-term concentrations versus big time thinking. And it's really hard to bounce, like it's really hard to bounce in between you know, the John Grimsow that needs to focus on a Rask that gets dialed in perfectly versus the John Grimsow that thinks about the process of delivering this phenomenal knife to his customer and building this company around it. Yep, yep. You're right, they are different roles. Um, and in a way, that's how you could almost hire a machinist to do that kind of work, you know, if you can train them and trust them and all that. Right. Um, but it'd be a lot tougher to hire a big picture entrepreneur CEO, you know, to run your company. <laughs> right, but even the hiring stuff, like that's my, I have no regrets. I, I like what we're doing and uh, where it's going. I like the people that work for me, but I, I probably get, an, you know, it's like this week we had, Kevin in helping teach the classes, Jared is normal, Noah and Carly. So that's four other people. And I bet you every, uh, every 15 minutes, I bet um, there's a inbound question that I have to weigh in on. Ah. So, so that introduces what I sort of call the third John, which is the John that's like the shop foreman or like guru problem solver, because it's one thing to get a guy who's a good machine. It's another, it's another thing to get somebody who needs help troubleshooting you know, I, I guess it makes me appreciate how much I've learned over 10 years about machine operations and maintenance and functionality and, and fixturing and measuring and, and how to, how to, you know, how to think it's, it's tough. Yeah. <clears throat> you can't just, the you, you just get to hire people and just, you know, they, they need help and interaction and so forth. Yeah. Well, it, it's funny cause you and I, we've learned organically as we've needed and we know a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, you don't. You almost don't appreciate how much we've learned over the years because right. we've had to, and because we taught ourselves, and because we're, we're so hungry and like interested in this kind of stuff. Right. Stay up till four a.m. reading Practical Machinist just because. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've been I, there. I know you have. <laughs> I literally was trying to think about somebody was talking about a Blanchard grinder, which I continue to be fascinated with. And no, I'm not buying one, but uh, right. Um, I was like, I need to go to bed last night. And I was like looking at uh, the, what's that like Knifematic or Kinetic company? They're on Instagram. They have some old yeah. videos running like an 84 inch Blanchard in their shop. And I'm like way up too late watching YouTube videos on like the ma <laughs> the magnetic pole density on Blanchard chucks. <laughs> but I love it, right? Of course. That's the beauty of what we get to do. It's like, yeah. it's awesome. 
you fall down the rabbit hole. It's a dangerous <laughs> rabbit hole, but <laughs> yeah. Um, lathe parts are running good. Mills running good. So it's just business as usual. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm go, trying to figure. What's that? No, you go ahead. No, I'm just I'm struggling with uh, this part we're working on or product that we're working on, and I I'm fine with it being three operations, but trying to figure out whether I create um, all my outside profiling early on and then reference off of that as it gets flipped and moved around or whether I yeah. basically poke holes through it, use those to fixture. And then in the final op, create all my outside, like sort of do as little as I can to get it in its final fixture position and do all the work there. Normally my mentality is I like to remove all as much material as I can early on and create my reference geometry early on. But it's really, I've been really struggling with it. Yeah, that's normally what I would do too, especially the finished profile. Um, and then you can probe the X and right. Y right. off of the finished wall. Um, right. But that means I have to, what the problem that I'm finding is that because I'm just using, I don't have locating pins. I just have through screws to clamp it down is that I then have to create a little bit of slop in those holes. And then I will have to tram, either tram it in or push it up against a fence because when I right. flip because when you flip it, you can probe it, but probing it does nothing to do with confirming that the part is is held in tram or square. You, you can. You can probe You can it. probe I for know. taper G80, I don't know what it is. But you I can, mean, and it sounds super easy. Um, yeah, but I'm not there yet, and it also just bothers me because I don't... If that worked, it'd be great, but the reality is if it didn't work, I would immediately need to fix that or, or get it trammed in because um i don't i guess i just don't trust trust it yet keep it yeah, simple I, there's no reason why i shouldn't be able to get this thing done if you need to i think it should be a very um reliable way to do it my only fear with doing it is not turning it off at the end of the cycle so oh. if you if you trammed it in 45 degrees and right. yeah it runs fine everything's 45 degrees but you stop the code right before the end or something, and then mm -hmm. it's still off 45 degrees, and you right. forget, and you switch, you know. For folks, that are, fear. for folks that are listening, the idea is, like, if you put a, a single vice down on the mill table, but instead of having it trammed in, let's say it was 2.244 degrees angled to the right. If you tram, if you used your Renishaw probe and picked two points along your jaw, it will actually update all of your code as it runs to compensate so... You could, in theory, not in theory, in practice, machine a perfect part, even though your vice isn't trammed in. Is that right, John? Right. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think Cra I've ever crazy. done it, but I've read enough about it to, to trust it if I had to do it. Um, but yeah, I'd say either do that, push it up against a fence would be a great idea, like a fixed trammed in thing, yeah. or, um, or put in fixture pins. Yeah, no, so one of those I'll do. I just, I, I don't like the philosophy of using a new technology Hell, neither one of us have used it to solve a problem that really is just fundamental to basic work holding. And my my crime yesterday was I made an assumption. I assumed that when I flipped it and held it with screws, I assumed that it was up against a fence. And sure enough, it wasn't quite perfectly up against a fence. And I didn't sweep it with an indicator. And sure enough, you know, it was out four thou over 20 inches, which is not much, but it was enough that it caused a problem that I didn't think about and you know that's that's uh that's when you you again don't i don't let myself get in my truck at the end of the day in a bad mood i try to smile and say this is awesome like yes that's frustrating yes i should have caught it but you know what there's no reason to let that drag you down you know that's that's uh just learning yeah it, it's the kind of difference that drives you nuts at the end of the day <laughs> fourth hour right. Um, right but yeah as I've learned, I mean, I've spent a lot of time researching and testing fixturing techniques. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say it's one of my big things that I'm really focused and passionate about is just learning as much as I can. And uh, I'm not afraid to try new methods and new technology, even if it doesn't work, because I've learned then and I could maybe maybe apply it to the next one. But if it works, it's magical. That's true. So, you know, I, I, I tend to, quote unquote, waste even entire days um, falling down these rabbit holes of of learning new techniques, new technologies, new, oh, look, I can do a G233 P1 or whatever it is. Um, yeah. And it helps with this. Let's, let's do that. Um, yeah, what's the, yeah, I guess I miss that. Maybe I've become unfun. I miss that, like, freedom of time to experiment. 
um, I to yeah. maybe too focused on. Hey, do you think one of the things that would make it easier if I could remove the fixturing? Let's say they were outside profile fixture pins. I think. Do you think it would work to have like a couple of dowel pins? Push the part up against it, <clears throat> clamp it down, and then pull the dowel pins. That should work, right? Maybe. There should be a little bit of pressure on the dowel pins. I mean, if, yeah, if right. you want tenths of uh, accuracy here, I don't need tenths to have uh, the. You just want less than four thou. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my that's my goal for today. Yeah, I I would spend put the timer on for fifteen minutes, or ten <laughs> minutes, and and Google this uh, work the organization off, offset, angle, yeah, offset thing, and just see if it's easy or hard. You just because it sounds really points. easy. Yeah, you yeah. are right. That would solve this whole thing, huh? It's also good because it would be a in it would be a form of it's almost like checking toolware. If I happen to have a problem with my fixture, it's just going to detect it. Yeah. What's the harm? Awesome. Yeah. I so gotta, it's. It, you know how how much do you trust it? But just trust everything. <laughs> trust but verify. Tr- trust nothing. <laughs> trust nothing. <laughs> uh, no, trust but trust but verify is good. No, like that. Go, uh, uh, kind of funny, but going back, like keeping that indicator right there next to the machine, just like sweep everything, like check it all the time. Yeah. Also, awesome. yeah. I got to run the kids to a daycare before work. All right, sounds good. I'll see you, bud. Crush it. Have a great day. Yeah, you Take too. Care.